Hey everybody, welcome to the Post Movie Podcast. I'm Steve Head. I'm John Black. And welcome to the apartment. Another rough movie going week, huh, John? Well, you know, I was I was thinking about this, and I'm convinced that this is my least favorite time of the year for movies. Because uh, about a month, month and a half ago, yeah. someone flushed the toilet at Sundance, and now all the shit's bubbling up into theaters for us to see. Or I'm Toronto. So, yeah, and I'm just so sick of seeing pretentious, artsy-fartsy films. It's everywhere. It's always going to happen. I know, but it yeah. seems like it's it's after those two festivals that suddenly we're we're watching these cell phone movies and these angst ridden teenage romance things. And was there one film in particular that struck you that set me off this time? <laughs> was it? Um, I'm gonna have so much trouble with this title. Martha, we'll talk about this later. Martha Marcy May Marlene. That was that, was that the one that that was that was a while. I saw it a while ago because they came in for the interviews, yeah. but I. Uh, I wasn't a big fan of that. The one that set me off this time was, um, uh, oh, it's the one. I just, did, oh my God, I just interviewed the director yesterday. Like crazy. Really? Oh my God. Not yeah, only did I, I feel, I was, I felt so old when I left that movie. Be, you know, but it's 20 somethings. And I was, when I was talking to the director, he admits they didn't have a script, they were ad living. Yeah. And, you know, they had the script was like 25 pages. It was like, we need to hit these emotional marks, and then you guys say what you need to say. And they're, they're 20-somethings. They don't know how to ad lib or be dramatic. Were the journalists also from college papers? Oh, I got a one-on-one, on one, which, was, which was tough because I yeah. obviously didn't like the movie. <laughs> um, but they'll never know That's that until one. they listen to this. They didn't pull a Stephen Baldwin on you. No, no <laughs> Stephen Baldwins. So there's that. There's... um. Uh, Margin Call was this week, which is a pretty pretty much a, an indie film that never should have seen the light of day. You know, I saw a ton of movies this week, but I haven't seen like some of the prime ones that are coming out over the next couple of weeks, like Margin Call and uh, George Clooney's the, uh, the Descendants, which I just saw is coming to the Coolidge. But not for like a week, right? Okay. They haven't shown. I don't think that opens. It opens for um, week or something uh, in the middle of November at the Coolidge. Yeah, the, the Descendants and uh, some other stuff. I think, in particular, like we had trouble this week trying to see uh, the Three Musketeers. Some you know, of it was a whole did. like cat and mouse game going well, on there. I don't know. Here's here's the other thing. This is why I started out with telling you how much I hate indie films. And this movie, The Three Musketeers, directed by Paul W. S. Anderson of um, Resident Evil fame. Yeah. And his wife Mila, wife girlfriend, whatever Mila Jovovich. Jovovich. And um, it was getting shit on by by critics before it even hit theaters. Yeah, I had a couple of I have a lot of Facebook friends, which is pretty cool, but also get so much crap. Um, part of the crap is uh, notes from other journalists talking about journalists laughing at the Three Musketeers. But, yeah, you know, you know. So I just automatically assume it's another Paul w. w. S. Anderson film. But I like his movies. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But well, I just I don't want to give a a big review of uh oh we'll get we'll get to it i, wanna, right. I wanted to get to some uh, theater announcements um some stuff coming out um the harvard film archive has uh a retrospective of uh, sergio leone or sergio leone once upon a time in america november 5th i i just i don't remember if i really mentioned this on the last but john says i did i i i have i have not a Whatever, mention it again. But, <laughs> it's worth it. Um, they're playing the full 240-minute European version that was never shown in America. Maybe it was the one that was released on video, but um, when Paramount released it here, was it Paramount? Uh, they re-edited it just to put it in some sort of reasonable order. Right, as right. Opposed to, as opposed it's to... It's an um, epic. Yeah. It's an epic. And you know, the thing is, is films like this, and I'm glad they're also bringing back like uh, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly... Duck you sucker! Uh, yep. All the spaghetti westerns, which Fistful of Dollars. I've never seen on the big screen. Th- that is just that's the real draw yeah. about Harvard. I mean, if there's one thing that I would say to people, you really have to get over there to see the stuff because you just can't. I don't. I don't know. It's it's the texture of film. Yeah, you're not going to get it's, that. It's the real emotional surrounding of um, uh, you know seeing it the way it was photographed to be it's a real it's a it's a a rare opportunity to see these things in 35 millimeter and i don't think that that is something that immediately jumps into people's minds when they're making a 
I think it's know, spaghetti a, western. A, a, a decision on Friday or Saturday night as to you know what to go see, but um, they're making that decision when they go see some piece of indie crap at you know the Kendall. They're seeing that on the big screen. They're paying money. Why not see a classic? Yeah, I, know, I still think a lot of people just aren't. They they they'll be just as happy with watching it on demand as they would go into the theater. I think that's wrong, but I think it, that's how a lot of people think. It doesn't matter how big your your TV set is, the action, the um, the sound, the everything else is going to be better. Especially these spaghetti westerns, the setting is half the character here. You know, it's it's yeah. these men against this gi- these you know human men against this gigantic nature. That they they roam around in and it's just great stuff live. I have never seen or a on film a Leone film projected. So yeah. this is um I you know, it was a learning experience for me. I mean <laughs> I'd love to sit there for every film that they show for you know in the in the whole uh, uh, Antonioni series. I mean I just that's what I I don't have the time but Sergio Leone. Sergio. You oh did I just say Antonio? San Antonio. Tony Oni Onio, you're tired. <laughs> Tony Oni Leone. You've had a you've had a long day. Yeah, um, yeah, but I would, yeah. I would. I would much yeah. rather. I I can't wait. And the thing is, you know, you kind of roll your eyes at the fact that you're going to be there for 270 minutes. How long is it? Uh, 240. Yeah. With apparently 90 minutes added to it. So you uh, need, I mean, added to, to equal 240, obviously. You're gonna kind of roll your eyes at the fact that you're going to be sitting there for four hours. Yeah. But I've already do, already did that last month for Cleopatra. Cleopatra. So why not? And, and Charles Lord, Lord of the Rings, the extended edition cuts are you yeah, know, well, 240 I minute do range. That again. So the mm-hmm. first two weeks of November at the Harvard Film Archive are basically uh, Leone films. Once Upon a Time in the West uh, is on the 12th. Once Upon a Time in America is on the 5th. On the 6th, uh, for a few dollars more. And then, but on the 4th, I'm going backwards here, you get uh, a couple of the Clint Eastwood films, Fistful of Dollars in for a few dollars more. Plus, um, except for Once Upon a Time in America, they're cowboy movies. Come on. People, yeah. you know, and it's because I'm of that age when cowboy movies were part of my childhood. You went to see John Wayne movies. I wasn't that old. You know, it's funny with Leona. He wanted to stop doing this kind of thing. Mm-hmm. He wanted to stop making Westerns. He felt that he had s- said enough. And I, I think there was a time when he was offered uh, the opportunity to direct Once Upon a Time in the West, and then he could get. Um, you know the cast he wanted I think it was like Henry Fonda and Jason Robards so he was like okay I'm going back to the western I got my cast I got my money yeah. I'm going to go make that and he you know and then he went back there once again I think with uh, uh, what the, oh god what was the James Coburn one again Duck You Sucker Duck You Sucker yeah a few years later so Once Upon a Time in America being a, a gangster flick is, I guess his last film, but still in a way it changed. But I'm eager to see all of it. Yeah, and the thing is, um, I the other night on on demand, I was well, not on demand, but I had taped uh, this movie called The War Wagon Never with heard John of it. Wayne and Kirk Douglas. Hmm. Um, they're two guys trying to rob a stagecoach that's, you know, uh, metal plated and has guns in it, so it's a war wagon. Hmm. Not a great movie, but. It was like, you know, I got home at like 10.30, it was on, I started la- I started watching, I just sat there with this smile on my face, because it's John Wayne, it's a Western, Kirk Douglas, you know, walking around in this leather cowboy outfit with a with a gold bandana around his neck. I mean, he wouldn't get away with it today, but back then he looked cool, yeah. you know, and uh, just Westerns are cool. That sounds like a really good action piece, sounds very, in a way, similar to Stagecoach. Yeah. The New York Times, um, Dave Kerr wrote an article last week about the underappreciated 1960s remake of Stagecoach. Wayne Crosby and, and Margaret? Uh, very good. Yeah, it's just come out on DVD. What year was that? Very, Do you remember? I don't. I want to say 67. All right, so I was uh, eight or nine, maybe 10 when it came out. Mm-hmm. And I'll never forget the first guy who uh, gets killed gets an axe in the head from an Indian. And back then you could say Indians, they weren't Native Americans. This guy gets an atch- a hatchet in the head and falls down. And I've seen it since, and it's not graphic or anything, but when you're 10, it's the most oh, violent thing you've ever yeah. seen, you know? <laughs> when I saw the beast from 20,000 Fathoms eat the guy off the street, the it's police horrifying. officer who was yeah. firing the gun, that yeah. scared the crap out of me. Yeah, now I you kind of laugh. truly like, disturbed. Godzilla from versus the spo- smog, smog, versus the sp- 
smog, smog monsters monster, yeah. scared the crap out of me. Oh, you just blow smoke <laughs> rings. <laughs> it was frightening, man. But that's, you know, I think, um, and when people think about westerns, they always talk about John Ford, yada, yada, yada. I've never been a big John <laughs> That'll Ford. That'll be his Yeah, uh, his that's on his grave. That's on his grave, <laughs> yada, yada, yada. I've never really, I know this is blasphemy, but I've never been a big John Ford western fan. They're good, but I don't get a hard on looking at them. But I'll watch um, the War Wagon, or I'll watch um, Charles Bronson westerns, or you know, the Magnificent Seven. I'll watch over and over again. Yeah, man, I'm intrigued. Um, I feel like the War wa- Wagon should have been on my radar. Oh yeah, but, yeah. Uh, Any th- anything that's got John Wayne and, and Kirk Kirk Douglas, man. M- movies are like so far away from these things these days. Oh, I yeah. mean, take a look at what we're reviewing this episode. Uh huh. <laughs> What is, what is it called again? Martha Marcy May Marlene. Could be one it of the worst be. titles ever. Yeah, and then uh, The Three Musketeers. And Paranormal I mean, Activity I mean, it's just, 3. Oh, shit, right. Paranormal Activity 3. Just small-time movies compared to you know the legacy of John Wayne and John Ford I'm, and Sergio Leone. And I'm Clint just Andrew. reading a book now, a, a biography of um, Grace Kelly called High Society. Oh, I saw that on the shelf. And uh, at, uh, I got it for Am- at Amazon for like three bucks, and it's so good. But it's all about you know the Hollywood system and and the, you know how she picked her movies and her whole career and stuff. And her, you know, one of the first people she worked with was John Ford and then Hitchcock. Hmm. And um, she only made a handful of movies, but um, pretty fascinating stuff. And that's old Hollywood. I love stories about old Hollywood. I don't want to hear yeah. about now. I don't want to hear about Brett Ratner's career. Well, you know, I just... Career. It, maybe maybe time puts a, a spin on things, but it's it's really... And, and maybe because we're not really on the inside. We're only slightly on the inside. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's so, so the veneer for us isn't so, um, you know, not so magical all the time. <laughs> but, um, but when you start studying... Fi- when, when studying film from the... Hell, even the 80s now, but 60s, 70s, 50s. There's, yeah. there's a certain distance and a certain, um, you know, like this this idealism, at least in my head, about what, you know, movies were and could be. And and uh, it's, you know, fascinating that way. I, I guess I find covering contemporary stuff actually less fascinating. Yeah, at times. I, at times. This week, yes. <laughs> this week being one of those times. But, yeah. you know, trashing films is fun, too. We're not going to trash him all, right? Let's do this. You yeah. just saw uh, The Three Musketeers, the Paul W.S. Anderson film. Yes. I tried to, but uh, the week just, uh, the plans this week just didn't uh, didn't work out that way. I, I would have had to have gotten up at God knows what time this morning. And that and that God knows what time is maybe eight. Jeez. Nine. <laughs> Thank God no. you didn't go, right? <laughs> no. No, no, I, I, uh, I, I couldn't get to the theater. I was too far away. Out well, in, uh, Newton. Um, what do you think? Go I had it. a blast. I had an absolute blast. And the thing is, I went into the theater not, not necessarily tainted by all the shit people have been talking about this movie ahead of time, but I had some stuff I had to deal with beforehand. So I was in a pissy mood when I got there. <laughs> and would, would you? Was your coffee not right? No, it's Did just you not have no morning um, muffin. Just some financial stuff yeah. that really. Uh, pissed me off so i was sitting in there i'm pissed off i'm surrounded by the pass holes because it's a pass screening this morning no this was last night i went last oh. night okay and the movie starts and two hours later i'm walking out i got a big stupid grin on my face i've been thoroughly entertained fantastic 3d by the way fantastic 3d glowing review from john black here people and you know what this is I, the, the animation with which he's doing this it's not is, is a little it's disconcerting uh, <laughs> i admit because i'm not going to defend this movie as a great piece of cinema you know but outrageously entertaining had some of my favorite people in it so it's a great piece of candy oh yeah yeah it's it's absolutely not good for you it'll rot your teeth but it's it's sweet i just had a blast mila jovovich Hot. Yeah. Um, I just saw a little bit of her last night and um, dazed and confused. Surprised I mean, surprised that she was in that. It is easy to sit there, and I know it's 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 cr- some critics will think it's their job to sit there and watch her as Milady. She plays his character Milady, and she's gonna steal some jewels from the French queen, 
and then plant them on the British guys so there's some kind of war started, whatever. The plot here is ridiculous. <laughs> but I'm sure it's I'm sure it's as ridiculous as all the three Musketeer movies because it hits all, right. all the right points. But there's a scene where Mila Jovovich is on the rooftop in one of these big French gowns, and of course she strips out of the gowns so she's yeah, in I a corset. I thought she'd use it as a parachute or something. No, she she strips down to she's in a corset, and then she's got these like um, it looks like a scene from the Wild Wild West. She's got these spools of wire on her shoulders, and she she uh, lowers herself down, kicks a you know kicks guards' asses using a combination of like Matrix style kung fu and uh it's crazy yes i understand how a critic could sit there and go my god this is terrible what year does this take place again oh this i don't a, know what year did they century? have what know. year did they have flying you know warships based on designs by michelangelo or da vinci Michelangelo. never never da vinci didn't design giant dirigible airships <laughs> filled with filled with gatling gun cannons he never did this and i didn't give a <laughs> shit i was just going for it I just I was howling every time the action slowed down they did the Matrix stuff I was now up. now I want to see it oh yeah Christ, you'll man. hate it I was just you'll hate it but really? just bury bury your critics cap don't even bring it with you but I just had a hoot and holler well time. they knew it was gonna take a oh they did everything to keep <laughs> they, the press out they, of this they knew it was gonna take a humping mm-hmm. that's fine I humped the shit out of it <laughs> and we both walked away happy. I have nothing bad to say about it. I could I could sit there and pick it apart like I'm going to do the, with other movies today, <laughs> but I'm not gonna. It was just too much fun, too much fun. So <laughs> now I'm thinking like I got to rearrange some time next week to go see Three Musketeers. Or you know we can just wait for the for the for the hate mail to come pouring in from people who are already lined up to hate this movie and just telling me what piece. Of, oh yeah, they're there. What an idiot I am. They just don't think that Paul W S Anderson is a. Um, he you made know, Resident he's, he's, Evil. Um, he he's like a modern. He's not as bad as Albert Pune, but sort of who? kind of like that. A guy who directed a lot of science fiction stuff in the late eighties, early nineties. Cyborg, Captain America, by the oh, way. Oh yeah. Um, Nemesis, just a uh, bad director. Uh huh. And I think Paul W. Sam Anderson has the image of being a not a Yui Ball, but not too far away. But you could classify him as a guy that gets the job done. I think he's got a like, great... Like Brett Ratner, less <sighs> than. I mean, I, he, t- he makes technically proficient films. Yeah. They're you didn't like not... Resident Evil? I enjoyed it. Yeah. But it's dumb. Well, <laughs> Obviously. you know... Stupid. Uh, there are movies um, I saw this week that I it, didn't it enjoy in there. what it dumb. is. It is... Martha uh, Mary Mercy Get a Better Title was... I oh, didn't enjoy it. Well, this one's receiving some dumb. fantastic reviews. What? Martha Mary Mercy... Yeah, Martha, Marcy, May, Marlene. Well, you know, that's because uh, the critics love it. Uh, it won the, I think it won the Audience Award at uh, Sundance. Yeah. And I'm just looking. Um, I have no respect for that. Really? Yeah, it's Sundance. Taking a look here at the. Uh, it was shot on a cell phone. It has a crappy ending and doesn't mean anything or mean something pretentious. Of course, yeah. it's loved by Sundance. Well, anyway, I thought I'd come across a whole bunch of. Glowing reviews, but uh, <laughs> it's mood. It's mise en scene. Oh wow! You know, oh boy, is is <laughs> dreary. And there is, uh, as opposed real, there, to, I'd say this: the movie has a couple, on, of, couple of good scenes. Are we on Martha Scandal Mary Madonna. Mercy? Yeah, we're on Martha Mary. I'll keep saying it wrong. Martha Marcy May Marlene. And Steve, what does the title mean? Because I sat through it and I wasn't quite sure. Well, this is the story of a girl who's trying to escape a cult. Somewhere in Connecticut? Is it Connecticut? I think so. Somewhere? Upstate New York? Yeah, so she um, she's experiencing some... She's having real mental trouble. And uh, Elizabeth Olsen is the girl who plays uh, this girl trying to escape. Um, she uh, She's having like some sort of post-traumatic stress. You know how they do that in movies, you know, with the flashback and everything. She can't seem to mentally adapt back to real life after this cult has been messing with her. This cult led by uh, John Hawks, terrific actor, and uh, his uh, his cronies have been trying to get her, you know, reel her back in. So she takes up residence with her sister and uh, her sister's new husband, uh, Hugh Dancy, and uh, they 
they basically she she acts out in a way that is just like so strange that you know it's unsettling it's a dreary film Mm -hmm. yes it is and it's disturbing Mm. and when we see these things that she does that just aren't right you know just she just doesn't act in ways that we ascribe normality to I right mean, she walks around uh naked with, with the incorrect clothes let's just put it that way she's uh <laughs> well, we can say naked steve it's she, an adult she, show it's uh she's urinating on herself it's uh well it's, she that scene which i think is is just ridiculous it's, she just doesn't a, have a sense she her her social intelligence is way off here. yeah she but it's not like really she just it. she inappropriately urinates on herself it's in a moment of emotional trauma that you know she yeah, wets herself to be fair it's not just you know it's, and but it's not like the exorcist see the way she's possessed and ruins a dinner party well this is this is a real psychological um excavation uh, um, word uh, of a sort um mine it, it's it's John Hawks plays a, uh, a sociopath mm-hmm. who tries to exercise control over people by feeding up their egos and then uh, using these people to, to do what he, whatever he wants to do. I'm not, I, I think he just kind of like gets off on controlling people as opposed to, I don't know if he's trying to ultimately, you know, he's, he's running some sort of a cooperative that's almost like, you know, some like 19th century farm or something like yeah, that. Yeah, but, and, you know, he also... Um Forces himself on him sexually, oh, causes yeah. them to commit robberies I forgot about and crimes. The rape. I forgot about the rape. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, there is a couple of disturbing scenes where John Hawks proves his ability to mentally control the people around him. And it's sort of like also he, they exemplify his lack of regard, regard for human life. It's more like it's more important for these people around him to do what he says, uh, you know, uh, just to, to prove that he will kill you. You know, like, well, now we'll just point the gun at him. Do you want to shoot? You know? Yeah. As he's trying to make a point to uh, Martha Mary Mercy. Young Miss Olsen. Yeah. And then there's a scene where they, um, this uh, cult group is, is caught breaking into a, a house in town. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's somewhat disturbing. So I would say there's parts of this movie I liked, and I liked what uh, Sean Durkin, we interviewed him, had to had to say about it. You know, his his reasoning for um, you know, sort of staying in this real depressing zone. Mm-hmm. Like I think the movie needed to breathe. The only character that had real sanity here is um, Hugh Dancy, who's basically kind of like what the fuck. Right, you know, I'm right. Not gonna he's like the voice of the gonna, audience. Yes, yeah. and um, I thought there was a huge problem with um, kind of drowns in this mood. John Hawks, really performance. I just I thought there was nothing either charismatic or threatening about this guy. Nothing drew well, me in, and nothing uh, repulsed me. That's subversive and dangerous about him. No, the, the fact that he takes people who are sort of emotionally weak and messes around with them. I I didn't believe he was doing that. I thought they were. Um, people who knew what they had to do according to the script. I didn't feel there was any connection between them, any kind of reason for them to do it otherwise, other than the script telling them they had to. I thought it was a pretty bad performance from him. It's and a it's a moody film. I just didn't really feel like I liked it that much. It's kind of moody, but it's a one note. It's like moody depressing. There's no... I didn't feel any tension. I didn't feel any threat. The Definitely no him. humor. Um, just, you know, this sick... I you think know, that, that this is another film where we um, finished watching it and it kind of fell into the what we've been saying about films recently was that don't be afraid to be funny. The, right. The, the filmmaker, the writer, the actors, they shouldn't be afraid to let some air out of the balloon by putting some humor in there. Right. It, it would Again, really not and, and it won't, know. It's not as... And, and I really believe it's not going to hurt the film or the tension that they fear they might be ruining. Right, so. and I'm um, I'm really sick of these freshman year film school 101 quasi European film endings. <laughs> you know, there's you know it's like they saw a couple of French movies from the 50s and they go, oh that's how you end the movie. <laughs> no, it's not. We need a little more than just here comes a threat. Stop. Uh, it, w- it was in this. It was in the. Uh, there's another crappy ending on that like crazy movie. It's got a. Mumblecore ending element to it. Is that what they call it now, Mumblecore? I don't know. It's not just I, crap. I, I would say what they're trying to call it is DIY, but and which know. means do it yourself, right? 
Yeah. So does that mean I have to come up with my own ending because the director couldn't find a better way to end the film than just like cutting it? Well, who are we to say how a film is supposed to end? Critics. It's our job. Yeah. I I have no. It's not a. It's not that it's a good or a bad ending. It's just. It doesn't feel like an ending. It just doesn't feel complete. It's just a. You open the door, movie starts, close the door, it's over. It's, it's a glimpse. Yeah. Slice of life. Slice of bad life. I I think there's a certain crowd that'll dig it. It's um. It's playing at the. It opens at the Coolidge next week. What is it on the. Uh, the 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 twenty eighth I think I don't know you check it out there do and if, if you're in, if I mean if you're up for it if you like this kind of mental it, games and, stuff you know and for the for the for the crass out there who might be listening you do get to see an Olsen sister naked <laughs> just for the crass and if that's all I take away from the movie that's fine I had my fun okay. But if you're interested in seeing this movie, even if it's for that reason, I would hurry because I don't think it's going to last. Did you more do the roundtable interview with her? Mm-hmm. Yes, I did. She's very pretty in person and very nice, very nice lady. Yeah, uh, I had a lot of fun talking to her. Very uh, down to earth, uh, smart, beautiful. What the hell was I doing in a room with her? <laughs> no one knows. Yeah, yeah I'd Martha, rest to see her. Marcy, May, Marlene. Next week, people. A little more fun was. Paranormal Activity 3. Guilty um, pleasure, I guess, on my part. I'm in the same... I'm, I want to say right away, I did not like the ending. That It bothers me. Yeah. But that's all I can say because, you know... I, just, I haven't seen Paranormal Activity 1. Oh, I haven't seen Paranormal Activity 2. Because you're judging it as what you call a cell phone movie. Yeah. And you can look at it that way, certainly. But the movie, these all of these films... And Paranormal Activity 3 um, achieves, again, successfully, this sort of disturbing sense of uh, foreboding, mm-hmm. which is fun. The, but, and, and it's done. It's, it's really simple. You know how they do it. They right. just place a stationary camera in the bedroom. They explain how they set it up. Right. And then in any circumstance, we watch the people sleeping or we watch what's going on downstairs when no one's in the house you know, downstairs. Mm-hmm. And our minds sort of go on a search mission. We we look for any sort of variances in any of the objects. Did that chair move? Did that door open? Exactly. And that's kind of what happens at night when people are sleeping, when someone might be alone in the house or whatever and, and get scared. It's because of the stillness. So the movie plays on that. You know, mm. it's it's all the, like, how can they scare you? How can they lead you along? How can they bait right. and switch and do it? And it's it's good fun that way. You know, these aren't. I I save cell phone movies for the uh, indie artsy fartsy stuff. These are more found footage movies, and I hate those too. This is a found footage. movie. I hate those things. Make the fucking well, movie. Don't find what's, my footage. What's happened here is for this uh, for this third version. Um, assuming a lot of listeners have seen the first two, we go back into into the late 80s I believe it is I think at the time the movie is, is actually prequel? the movie's actually uh, it's a prequel of sorts it's um it takes place I think actually uh, in the nine in, in, in the early 90s when a newly wed couple is um, or a couple who's been married for I guess they've it's in the 90s or so they've been married for eight or nine years now and they have a couple of daughters Um. Uh, a uh, eight-year-old and a five or six-year-old and um they discover their vhs wedding tapes or he's a i wouldn't say really discover it but he makes wedding videos and he goes back into some of the videos that um that he that he made right some some of these videos actually i think the time when they watch the videos and the time that it's not too far apart because considering what happens at the end it, it, it can't be but um so he sets up these cameras in the house in the girls' room, you know, and in, you know, just like they do in the first two, they they explain why they they also have a lot of um, uh, roving camera stuff because he has an assistant who works with him okay. at uh, you know uh, cutting uh, wedding wedding videos in sort of an office or basement of the house, and um, as they establish in the first movie, what what attracts the demon now? What attracts these demons now? We we think we're, we're 
a lot of people think paranormal activity, uh, you know, it's, um, it's ghosts. Um, what it really is is a demon, there's a, and there's a difference. The demon is much more, you know, aggressive and, and right. dangerous. And the demon is attracted to negativity. So it's things right, better kinda, stay away from us, huh? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> they should be haunting film reviews. <laughs> so the demons, uh, you know, when stuff goes, starts to happening in the house and people start getting uh, all in a hissy about it, you know, and then negativity starts flying back and forth, that's what kind of brings the demon out more, you know? Like bad vibes. Well, maybe. yeah, but they, but they also have, um, uh, the backstory is, is that they, they uh, children are more susceptible to this type of contact they have some sort of something that the demon responds to. And um, so they slowly come to the realization. And, and the person that they need to really prove it to is his wife. So this guy sets up cameras in his daughter's room. And uh, every now and then, some freaky-ass shit happens. <laughs> where everybody in the audience is like, whoa, that was fucked up. And then the, the demon, you know, in his just invisible form, just starts getting meaner. And meaner. And I actually was getting like really fucking pissed at this fucking demon, <laughs> you know, because I don't like seeing kids in peril. Right. But right. I will tell you, man, the performance by the two kids in this movie, their their performances are terrific. These two young actors really sell it. Uh -huh. There's a scene where uh, his wedding video assistant is watching the kids for a few hours and they go into the bathroom to play this little ch children's game about, uh, you know, Mary, Mary, Quake, something. I don't know where you, whatever. Uh, so they, they, they do this, ra this chant that's supposed to bring uh, a, a vengeful spirit into the space. Right. And something happens that scares the fucking shit out of the video assistant guy and the girl. And this scene is just the little girl in this movie, the eight-year-old. She does a wonderful job of really, really just conveying the terror and the belief as to what's happening here. What didn't really um, sell me on the on this movie was the fact that um, their grandmother is involved. Their grandmother <laughs> is involved <laughs> in what's going on here, and their the grandma you know their mom's mom you'd think that the mother would be a little more apt to accept what uh, her husband is trying to show her with these videos that he's made. This is just just one really cool creepy ass scene where uh, they you know he knows that something's kind of funny in the house but they don't think it's like you know they think that this 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 guy <laughs> this guy this demon right right who is really only seen by the young girl, the six-year-old, who she has named Toby. They are left with a babysitter for a couple hours, and they sort of play around with the sheet <laughs> to pretend to be a, you know, a ghost. Or, yeah. There is a scene, yeah. Well, the, what, what they do that's different in this paranormal activity film is um, the guy devises a way to hook up the camera to an oscillating fan. Huh. So, the, so when whenever they cut to the scenes that are downstairs in the house, right, the camera pans across the entire downstairs. It's split level, sort of open downstairs. So you can you can the camera will pan from the living room. You, you the far side of the pan, you're in the kitchen. Right. So the camera's constantly oscillating back. And and does forth. it have the whir of the fan? The what? The whir of the fan with it. No, you you get a little hiss, yeah. something like that, uh, and it's a, and it's a completely stable uh, fan. I mean, the the image, the video images are so stable, so as to be, you know, for so it's for us to the audience, we can kind of play the where's Waldo, where's the <laughs> goals kind of thing. So when the babysitter's over after they've just played this little game of you know ghost upstairs, uh -huh. she's downstairs in the kitchen by herself, and the camera's oscillating back and forth. You know, her in the kitchen, camera oscillates back. Right, you know, kind of pulls back into the living room, and mm -hmm. you see the fucking ghost like standing there, frozen under the blanket, under the under the <clears throat> bed sheet. Right, yeah. camera pans back. She's in the kitchen. Camera pans back. Nobody in the living room. But camera pans back to the kitchen, and the ghost is standing behind the babysitter. And she quickly turns around, and right before she does the thing, it just disintegrates. So basically, all she sees was just the sheet on the floor 
That's it. But we, who are privy to this from our third eye view, get to see what's actually happening. It's happening. It's um, Sarah and I enjoyed it. She, admittedly, uh, yeah, I jumped a couple of times, but it's it's you know it's just designed to be that way. Yeah. You know, yeah. if a, if a filmmaker wants to, they can make you jump with a quick loud noise and and net it. And that movie has a couple. The movie has a couple of good scares. I don't really like the ending. Right. I, I just right. don't think it jives. But um, <laughs> you know, it's the family tries to do the safe the safe thing. Right. You know, but. Eh, didn't quite work out. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm it's a it's a it's a creepy ghost. Uh, it's one of the you know it's a, it's a confined space ghost movie. Found oh, footage. demon movie. Yeah. It's found footage demon movie. I will not say. John, not going. Try it. Nope. Try the first movie. No. Nope. Just no interest. Come on. Nope. You like ghost movies. I like or, I okay. like horror movies. I can't stand found footage movies. I'm so sick of them. I'm burned out. Okay. Read Ty's review. Okay. See what he has. To, you know, just you don't think I'm convinced by what you said? No, because what I'm saying is, is that you can you can say that this is this kind of movie and you don't want to see it, right? But you like creepy shit, and there's some creepy shit that goes on. You Does know, it so add that's up fun. To something besides just creepy shit. Um, there's a running story that. Uh, that the paranormal activity movies are based on. And, and that is that, uh, a real story that the demons are predisposed to hover or, or haunt these particular people for, you know, whatever reasons. And, and I guess each of the film kind of gives you a little more background as to why this happened in that family's past. Mm hmm. Yeah. It's some creepy shit. All right. <laughs> John, John's, uh, John's rolling his eyes. Yes, so I that am. so so I'm I'm satisfied with that. Good. No, I just too much. There's too much time and too much to see. It doesn't have any pull for me. You don't want to contribute to the millions of dollars that these guys are making off this no. simple concept. No, considering it probably takes about 150, 175 bucks to make. No, <laughs> you know. This was made by the this movie. I think it was made by the guys who made that film, Catfish. Remember that? <sighs> yeah, I remember that movie. That so. Another piece of crap. You know, what I, you know what I think we should do for the podcast? What? We should get either, we should tape a, we should get an oscillating fan and tape a camera to it so it can swing back and forth between you and me. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe one of those Teddy cams. Maybe. That's the next thing. It would be Teddy cam footage. Maybe something. Oh, by the way, Teddy Ruxpin makes an appearance in Paranormal Activity 3. <laughs> he does? Yeah, and he gets a pretty big laugh at his first, you know, because he talks by himself, you know? What did he say? see the movie man. i had it's, um, it's not about i don't think it's about the fact that he actually talks it's that, that, like it's one of those scenes when something is going on in the scene and you cut the, the dog and the dog gets the laugh right you cut to teddy to teddy rucks do teddy you want to explain to to anyone uh under the age of maybe 40 what a teddy ruxman is <laughs> <laughs> he's a bear that you put a couple of batteries in him and he talked he was like one of the first like talking bears that that some people i thought felt like was a little, a little, uh, a little weird. I had you a Teddy. <laughs> I had a Teddy Ruxpin. So and the movie plays on that. Yeah. I remember um, being the curious child I was, ripping his head off <laughs> to see what was going on, and that's terrifying for a little kid because it's just a mechanized like um, tinker, but not a tinker toy, a rector set, you know, monster underneath there yeah. talking. It was scary. The eighties. Um, ambiance here was kind of, you know, like when the babysitter shows up and she's got her, you know, stonewashed jeans and coiffed hair. What was like. that? What was that horror movie that came out a little while ago? Hell House, Legend of. Uh, um, there's so many horror movies. That no, came but out this a was a while ago. How this was um, a few years ago. Played up at the Coolidge. 80s? Devil House. Devil. Oh, House of the Devil. Was that House of the Devil? I saw the devil or something. Yeah, I no, know not I saw the devil. But it's the one that the devil worshippers in the house. Yeah, and it had that house crazy of the devil something. And it had that crazy '80s vibe where like they yeah. had Walkmans and headphones. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was just crazy stuff. Yeah, same thing. The ass, the acid wash jeans, the Farrah Fawcett hair flips. My favorite throwback mm -hmm. Walkman moment mm -hmm. is is Willem Dafoe in Boondock Saints. <laughs> when he, you know, pre iPod when he pulls out the big clunky CD player to to get his. 
I, classical music fix. I have uh, I have two of those at the office. And I, I often I often scare the younger kids when I go, look what I got. It's a disc, man. It's awesome. I can play my CDs you just, in it. You just show up anywhere with a disc, man. And people They're be crazy. Like, oh, fuck? yeah. Yeah, you, you might as well have a, a ghetto boombox walking down the street like Rashid. It's, or... I, in, in, uh, in Brian De Palma's Dress to Kill, mm -hmm. when um, Nancy Allen is being uh, harassed on the subway platform and the hoods have the giant boombox – just the throwback. You yeah. just got to love it. We need more boombox. But, you know, here's the thing. Remember, boomboxes, again, these were just gigantic um, tape machines for, yeah. for the youngsters out there. And But pe they, people did not play them with headphones. They played them. They'd yeah. be marching down the street, you know, with these boomboxes, thumping out some boom mu music. Can they even do that today? You get a ticket for something well, like that. Well, here's the thing. I was on the subway the other day, and there was a young kid there who was playing his fucking tele his cell phone like it was a boombox. He had his music coming out of his cell phone. Mm -hmm. It sounded like shit. It sounded like one of those old transistor radios, you know, the battery operated ones that got AM channels. Yeah. It was awful and he was just sitting nodding his head so we could all enjoy this this, you know, dance music he was playing. Uh, and you know the old it's, man and me just wanted to yell at him. The, the 80s throwback. Uh, I think they think they had a boombox in the kids uh in the kids' room. Because the camera in the movie, it goes back and forth so many times, and you so often see the same angles right? that the, um, the props, you know, the things in their room sort of become like characters in a way. Mm -hmm. Like, how many times is it going to pan past the rocking horse? Right, right. Uh, the light bright sitting on the counter. <laughs> that was fucked up. You know, Did just the demon the leave a in message the, in the light bright? Mm. I'm, now I'm, the light bright theme's going through my head. Can't say. Light bright, making things with lights. <laughs> All right, so let's leave this I think movie. we're good. Yeah. If I'm singing, it's time to end the review. Yes. Better than the Jurassic Park theme, though. We'll get, we'll get to that in the yeah. next episode. The next episode, you you'll hear that a lot. Jurassic Park going on. <laughs> You can listen to all of our episodes online. We're at post-movie.net, and we're on Facebook. You can like us there, and you can subscribe to us on iTunes and awesomely leave us a review. That would be terrific. And if you want to send us an email, that'd be great. We'd love to hear from you. We'd like to know what you thought of the films we talked about, and if you think we're totally wrong, let us know. Take John down a notch. Yeah, dare you. Just do it. Double dog dare you. Send us an email at contact at post-movie.net. Until next week, I'm Steve Head. I'm John Black. So long, everybody. Yeah, da 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 da